My name is Frank Turner, and I've been uh, running sled dogs now probably close to 35 years. And part of that has been uh, participating in the quest. I ran in 24 quests. We we're fortunate in 95, uh, my dogs won the race and uh, set the record that lasted for 12 years. I'm pretty proud of that, 10, 10 days and 16 hours. And I'm the only Canadian born person to have won the race. And I retired in uh, 2008. Um, it was the third time that uh, of retirement that actually stuck. The first two times I was kind of confused about it. And part of it is, I think, in most people's lives, if you've been fortunate to do something that you've really truly loved doing, but you know it doesn't last forever, it's picking that moment where you can let go. We were like the little choo-choo train that kept on coming back. Even still now, when I retired in 2008, you run into somebody in the grocery store, or Canadian Tire or something, and they say, well, when are you coming back? Are you going to run it again? And I say, no. And then the next question often is, do I miss it? I had to say, no, I didn't miss it. And you know, that was a nice place to be for me. There was no second guessing. That was the time to let go. You know, I can reminisce about races that we've had, and but I really appreciate um, the mushers that are running their dogs now. I love to see these wonderful teams that have been highly trained and hear new stories. It doesn't mean I have to give up my stories, but I love hearing new stories. So right. now, you know, we uh, our business um, we take a lot of people out on tours. You know, we had dogs and we had to develop a business. It wasn't like we wanted to get a business and got dogs to run it. We get people from all over the world. This is our little slice of the Yukon and how we live with the dogs. We don't dress them up. It's warts and all. Every one of our dogs are, are friendly here. We've got probably 30 rescue dogs that we've taken on and people just interact so if you're a doggy person then then we want you to come here we want you to see the dogs get your doggy fix and learn a little bit about this part of the Yukon What's it like racing against all these that are hardly, hardly These are just pups here. These are just pups. Yeah. Hey, I'm saying these are really slow learners. Yeah, really slow. Really slow learner, but I like the pups to break my trail here. So how do you rate your chances overall? Every year I average about 100 Every year I'm a winner. Once I finish this race, that's what I say. Cool. Thank you. Right, Brent. Where's Brent? Right here. Brent. Okay, this is Brent. Um, have you made a decision on silver yet? <laughs> hey, that's, the that's the dying. That's the dying question. He's going no matter what. Yeah, right. He's getting squirmy though. Uh, watch it. I mean, it's it's ninety percent. He's he's not going to go in the quest. Like, he's going to run an Iditarod, but uh, but I haven't made the final decision yet. It's going to be a race day decision. I've run every single race with him except for the two I've run this season and so he's gonna be uh, you know he'll be missed but I don't feel like I need him this year I have six of his sons in my team yeah. with a lot of Lance's blood mixed with silver so 
I'm pretty excited about that, and those dogs can uh, definitely pull the weight. So, but silver is silver. So, we'll any see. chances against this one? <laughs> you never know against this crowd. Yeah, no, no, right. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, I, there's nothing to commit to. This is a there's a, there's some steep competition here, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting out and, and traveling on the trail with them all. Good. Thank you. Yep. How is it racing with all these guys? <laughs> uh, I've always hung out with the guys my whole life. I've been kind of a, you know, athlete, so it's just like skiing or playing any other sports. It's fun. And your chance? Do you have a goal? Are you, are you sort of looking for a particular placing? Or? I'm the weakest link in my team, so I'm just trying to live up to the level of athleticism in my team. If I can meet that potential, then we'll do good. Lance, you're, you're down, you're listed as one of the top mushers. I don't know why. By the way, what, is it musher or musher? And where does the word come from? I don't know, you say it again, it sounds good coming from you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> musher. Musher. Musha. Musha. We're a musher. Where, 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 where does it actually come from? Explain it. Google it. I like that. I like it. It's, it's French. It's French. Okay. There you go. And, um, you couldn't come up with an easier question? Okay, okay there you go. <laughs> Next time I'll, I'll give you my laptop at the same time. You can Google it. While I ask no, that's why I'm a dog musher. I'm not very smart. <laughs> and, and how do you rate your chances against these guys? Like I said, one in twenty-four. One in twenty-four. We'll see. We'll see here in about well, hopefully under about eleven days. But good. I don't know. I just go with the flow and hope for the best, expect the worst. Good. What's it like handling Lance? <laughs> <laughs> Organized chaos. Okay, that's, no, that's, that's cool. Anything else? That was very polite. Yeah, right. um, how do you motivate yourself for the? I mean, it's a huge, huge distance. What do you do? There's beer at the finish line. <laughs> beer at the finish line. And the other question I got: You just moved. I understand you just moved from New Hampshire to here. Well, a few years ago, yeah. Okay. Did, yeah. Was that because of the race that got the boy? Sure. Pretty much. Yep. Yep. I mean, mushing in general, but the quest has kind of been my high point of my mushing career. So yeah, it's you could say the quest kind of got me here. And how long has your career been? Uh, I've been running dogs for like 20 years. This is my fifth quest. Wow. And other other races? Oh yeah. I mean, uh, not a did a rod, but I've done a fair number of other yeah. 200, 300 miles. Great. Thanks very much. There's a code of honor on the trail. When you're out there in those kinds of conditions, when things get nasty, working together and respecting one another is bigger than the race. So if there's somebody out there that's having difficulty, you're not gonna go by because you think you're gonna gain a competitive advantage. Somebody's having difficulties. There's, in my opinion, an obligation to stop and help that person because the only person that can help you during the race is another musher. Anybody else helps you, then it's a penalty. But mushers, because of that code, help one another. So it's a respect for that code to recognize that the code is bigger than the race. It's something that you kind of live by. There are mushers that, that run both races. And the Iditarod is show time, but running the quest is dog time. And I'm not minimizing the Iditarod. I mean, it's a tremendous, tremendous race. The mental pressures on the Iditarod because of the money and the purse and everything else, is tremendous. You let your foot off the pedal and you got six teams that are going by you. In the Quest, some of the teams are running it more like the Iditarod, but you're limited because of the configuration of the of the trail. In the Iditarod, they have 23 checkpoints. So you can almost run from checkpoint to checkpoint to checkpoint. In the Quest, there's eight checkpoints. From Pelly to Dawson City is 210 miles. From Eagle to Circle is 180 miles. So you're sleeping in your sled a lot. You have to be more independent. It's physically challenging. There's a lot of pressure on the Quest to be more and more like the Iditarod because the Iditarod is kind of like held up to be the the number one because of the money in the media. But for a quality dog experience, nobody beats the quest. Well, 
Right, Mike, um, when we sat at the bar, I honestly thought I'd be seeing you across the finish line. So tell us your story, what's happened? I uh, had a bit of a wipeout coming down in, was down off the summit, out of Eagle Summit, but uh, just wiped out on a glacier and just, uh, just drove my back into the ice and it popped my shoulder out forward yeah. and uh, it was dislocated out the front and uh, was not, you know, I, I put it back in on you the hill. You put it in yourself? I put, yeah, there was no chance of moving yeah. with it the way it was. It was yeah. excruciating. Yeah. It was, I couldn't have gone anywhere yeah. the way it was. Um, so I put it back in and mushed down to central and uh, at the time I still kind of thought I'd be able to continue. Mm. So I went through my dog team and took care of them as best I could with one arm and uh, went in and got a good good rest and, and got up and was the pain was worse than it had been and yeah. it was clear I was not going to be able to do what I needed to do to get to Whitehorse. Yeah. I've heard now that you're still doing the trail to help out. I mean, tell, me what, tell us what you're doing. Um, to continue on. Well, we had a friend come up from New Hampshire um, to handle for us, and she really, of course, wanted to continue and see the trail. So that was a big part of it. But also for me, I, you know, the quest is my family and my friends. And uh, Mr. Sass here is one of my one of my great friends in the world, and I'm uh, I'm honored to be here, able to help him yeah. a little bit along his way. Cool. And uh, anything you'd like to say to anybody that's going to view this? Well. Support the quest. This is a great event. It needs, needs help. The physical training is fairly universal, whether it's a quest or whether it's the Iditarod. You know, your nutrition, your conditioning of the dogs. They're athletes. And these dogs now, they're running 150, 160, 200 kilometers one shot. The only way that they can do that is by you taking care of them. Your success is based on the care of the team. So the physical stuff, you can read about it, you can learn about it, but ultimately with performance, a lot of it is, is gonna be your mental preparation. Knowing the trail, knowing what decisions to make in various places, trying as much as possible to anticipate what may happen out there. Mentally, your time management, all your organizing that you can do is done before the race. And the more you can save time by multitasking, you're not walking up and down the line one more time than you have to. When you walk it down the line, taking care of your dogs and feet, then you're doing it. One time, come back, boom, now we're gone. Your whole year, every day, you're thinking about what you might be able to do to be better because nobody's perfect. And if you can't think of something to be better, then you're stuck. You always have to be able to look a little deeper to find out what it is that you can fine tune a little bit more that's gonna save time, feeding, watering, how to do the boots. And then you incorporate that into your, into your planning process. Even when you're on the trail, finishing one race, then that's the time to remember and record, okay, what are you going to do differently? What did you learn this time that you can use next time? And But next time, you're still going to learn some new things. Nobody's ever at the point where it's 100% done. Coming down to a matter of seconds.
funny because we're you know I'm, I was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and he was born in, he's from Arkansas. We're basically two you know southern rednecks. You know I grew up in Chicago, out here playing in the north with our dog teams, and I'm doing like my all right, and he's doing his war whoop, and we were we literally been going at it for I don't know five six miles. I, I sort of screwed up. I was in the dark for most of the run on the river here, and then I thought it'd be the gentlemanly thing to let him know I was behind him, not just sneak right up on his back. So I actually turned my light on about a eighth of a mile away, just let him know I was coming, and I shouldn't have done that because that's when he took off on me. And so it took me another five miles to catch him, and then I had to bag a gringo. John Baker dog I got this year, so uh, gringo is a big boy, he's a Baker dog, and so I had to peck him the last five miles in. And, Sometimes, you know, though, when you pack a dog, you actually go faster. So this is one of those times I got lucky and we did. But yeah, it was, you know, even if I came in second, I didn't care. I was having fun out there. And, you know, Alan's a buddy of mine, and I have all the respect in the world for him. And uh, he won this race just as much as I did. Tell us about the cat and the hat. Dude. I uh, go around, I talk to 50 schools a year, talking about literacy, promoting reading, and living your dreams. And, uh, you know, I guess I'm living mine. How does it feel to be a champ? Uh, I don't know. It's it's a word that we're taught, you know, we all want to win and be champions and all that. And for me, that's not really what, coming in first isn't what makes a champion. It's what you do with what, when you do well in life. And uh, hopefully I can use this to do even more for kids and other folks because uh, I love to do good things. Basically, that trail is my training trail for when I was living out in Annie Lake with Tamara. So I've been on the trail quite a bit. I know every inch of that trail. and. I just, every hill, if I was going up even a little, couple centimeters in elevation, I would be running. Do you have any dogs that stood out on this run in particular? Big Walter up there with Tamara. He's uh, seven years old and you know, everybody talks about Silver and Brent's famous dog, but I've always known there's only one Walter. <laughs> He's the man. This team, you know, they did good in the quest, and you know, I'm good buddies with Lance, and I'm going for Iditarod next, so uh, I just can't get, I mean, Iditarod's all famous and all that, but we all around here, we know we love the quest, because the quest is all about the spirit of not only the north, but about the history of the north, and whenever I'm out on that trail, I just think about all the amazing people that have been out on these trails, and it uh, gives me motivation. Now that you're in Whitehorse, what's the first thing you're going to do to celebrate? Uh, make my uh, friend uh, Corgamon give me a beer. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, love up the dogs. We gotta take care of them, feed them up. But uh, yeah, I don't really plan on sleeping anytime soon. To tell you the truth, out of you know, this is my 20,000 mile race, and I've never won any race at all in my life. So this is the first one. So to do it here, it's a pretty special feeling, and uh, especially around a lot of you guys. a dog that is really oriented to being a leader, has really good ability to learn the commands. A leader, the main primary um, function of a leader is to set the pace, and that comes with that, that drive. You want dogs with really tough feet, and genetically some dogs have really strong bomb-proof feet, other dogs not so much. You want to look for dogs that hold their weight. Um, there's dogs that we call hard keepers. It doesn't matter what you feed them. It's really hard for them to hold their weight, their metabolism so quickly. And you may have a dog that's got great attitude. You need that. But a dog that gets thin very easily after 300, 400 miles. And when the vets examine them, if he does not meet standard, or she, they're out of the race. It used to be that we wanted dogs with really, really thick coats, but in fact, now, you know, our weather is getting warmer. The race is not as cold now as it used to be. So that's not quite as important as it used to be. Attitude is number one. A dog that always wants to go has a consistently strong work ethic. That has to be there first and foremost. You can be the biggest, you can be the strongest, you can be the fastest. But if you don't have a good attitude, everything else is gonna work against the team. My job 
is to make that team fit together like a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle. And when I can do that and there's no missing pieces, that's the best we're going to be and you can't ask for anything more than that. But it's the attitude that'll take you through the tough times. It becomes very intense, the relationships we have with our, our dogs and that interdependency. You know, the dogs don't run it alone, we don't run it alone. And when we take care of our dogs and allow them to exercise the natural abilities, that, then we just rock and roll. But that, that, that bond that we have with the dogs, that's the hook. That's the thing that keeps you coming back, that, that makes you want to be out there. Because we can find things on the trail with our dogs that maybe we don't find anywhere else. They're very, very special moments. Coming down to a matter of seconds. Some people put their lives into a dream. I put my life inside a song. I believe like believers believe in the song, in the song, in the song. And I walked so many miles, now I feel old. searching for happy on the other side a wave turning water into one and I've burned all the bridges I can burn the road is closing in sometimes you lose sometimes you win Storm someday you'll be strong. Someday.
Um, this year for the 30th, we have a whole bunch of events that are coming up. Monday the 28th up to February 1st. We have the Quest Fest that starts at the old fire hall right next to our offices. We're going to have presentations by Hugh Neff, who's a current champion from last year. Uh, John Firth will be around to do um, a bit of the history of the Quest. Karine Grenier and Marcel Frissino will be talking presentations in French about mushing. And it's just a place to convene, to meet up, ask questions, buy raffle tickets or banquet tickets. There's still some left. Um, and we're going to be open every day. Come and ask your questions. That's your chance to just touch base and who's running, any changes, what's going on. So the Wednesday the 30th is our Meet the Mushers. That's the free event. It's at Mount Mac. It starts at 6.30 in the evening up to 10. All the mushers will be present from both races because the mushers from the thousand miles will be there to sign posters and any kind of memorabilia for the public. And then the 300 mushers are there to draw their bids and start order. So that's where we're going to know who's going to start first for the 300. On the 31st is our start and draw banquet. And that's where the mushers of the main race will be drawing their bibs for their start order. The tickets are $75. We still have them available here in the office. We're going to have a sign and auction to raise money for the race. A whole buffet served by the High Country Inn. And we have another little surprise for the banquet planned. And I'm not going to re reveal that right away. You should come to the banquet to see that. And then, of course, the start of the race, um, Saturday the 2nd. Uh, the main race starts at 11 a.m. and then the 300 race will start at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. But come on down around 8 o'clock. All the dog trucks will be around and that's your chance to come into the dog yard and spend some time and see the dogs and the mushers. For security reason, we will be closing the dog yard around 10 a.m., just an hour before the race, because we need to make sure that there's no public around. When the teams are shooting to get into the start line, it can be dangerous. Those dogs are hyper and they want to get running. And so come early. If you want to walk around and meet the mushers, come early and you're, get, you're going to get your chance for sure. Look at our website. We have um, the live tracking that follows every single musher on the trail. So you can see the speed they're going, where they're going, where they're stopping and who's first. Our offices will be open during the race. We're going to have somebody here to answer your questions. Stop by and say hi. These are volunteers helping us out. They'll be happy to chat and let you know what's going on with our race.